hi guys it is a gorgeous 75 degree day in, in January down here deep in the heart of Texas here on we're on January 6th uh, 2020 when I'm recording this my name is Sam Mitchell and this is Collapse Chronicles and this is the first interview I will be that I am having in the year 2020 and I cannot think of a better better way to kick off Collapse Chronicles 2020, that is a scary term, uh, than with the great pleasure and honor I have of speaking with political cartoonist and columnist Ted Rawl. If you are not familiar with Ted's work, uh, we are getting, we're getting ready to change that. Ted Rawl is the political cartoonist at a newdomain.net, editor-in-chief of skewednews.net, a graphic novelist and author of many books of art and prose. On his website, Ted says, quote, I am out to change the world by changing people's minds about things. My criticism comes not from some good enough place, but by asking, in a perfect world, what would happen here? I set the bar as high as I can imagine it. All right, well, that is quite a, a promise to humanity to fulfill. So, Ted Rawl, come on and say hello to the folks at Collapse Chronicles, and we're going to dive right into this rousing conversation. Well, let's hope it's rousing. Hi, Sam. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm 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 quite sure it will be. Uh, and I, I've told Ted, don't don't b bother uh, holding back here. We we want uh, Ted to give us uh, whatever is on his mind in the opening bell of 2020. And guys, what I'm going to do? We're going to dive right into this. You, I have uh, a few days ago. I discussed this new essay by Ted titled A Grim New Definition of Generation X. And I'm going to put the link to this essay, if you have not read it, in which Ted Rawl comes out of the gate and the opening bell of 2020 and lays out his view of the future. So Ted, what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to read a, uh, a paragraph from here, and we're just going to dive right into it. So just just to whet your appetite, guys, this is what Ted had to uh, say a few days ago. <clears throat> Millennials and the children we call Generation Z face the horrifying prospect that they will get stuck with the tab for humanity's centuries-long rape of planet Earth the mass desecration of which radically accelerated after 1950. There is an intolerably high chance that today's young people will starve to death, die of thirst, be killed by a superstorm, succumb to a new disease, boil to death, asphyxiate from air pollution, be murdered in a riot, or shot or blown up in a war sparked by environmentally related political instability long before they survive to old age, long threatened, never taken seriously, not even now that it's staring us right in the face Human extinction is coming for the children and grandchildren we claim to love but will not lift a finger to save. Th that was a mouthful to open up uh, the 2020s, Ted Rawls. So uh, just take a riff on that. Uh, do you honestly believe that humans are going to be extinct uh, in the next few decades today's children will not see old age, and how does that make you feel? Well, there's a strong chance, um, and that's something that should be more than enough reason to act. Um, you know, look, 
I'm not a climatologist. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert on these on these things. Um, my, you know, a lot of this is about gut. And if you have been around a reasonable amount of time, you've noticed the changes and they kind of have to freak you out. I mean, you're looking at a world that just doesn't have as much life as it used to. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, uh, I got a uh, field guide to North American birds and I lived in Ohio. And I remember looking up in the sky, looking for all this variety of birds. But the truth is you didn't really see that many birds to begin with. And the ones that you saw were pretty much just crows and, uh, and, and, and maybe pigeons and uh, just uh, sparrows. Very, there just wasn't, you know, I mean, it was exciting and thrilling if you got to see a blue jay or a cardinal. And that's about it. And meanwhile, there's all these other species that were apparently, according to this book, fairly common just a, a decade or two earlier, but pretty much were gone and, uh, and now probably are gone. And if you just um, are looking at the team, if you live in any one place for any length of time, you've noticed and felt things warming up. Uh, that you see the pollution everywhere, and you read the statistics. I mean, I live on eastern Long Island in New York. Uh, one of the major industries here is fishing and shellfish, and um, Montauk is famous for its scallops, uh, very delicious big scallops uh, that are uh, that are exported all over the United States. Uh, you can buy them in California. And uh, just last year, the harvest went from bountiful to zero overnight, and the scallop industry did not diminish. It just completely ended, it's just like that, because of, of climate change. The water simply is too warm now, and the scallops just don't grow. They can't live here anymore. So, um, you know, you could go on and on and on and tell all these, um, you know, accounts that make you feel, that uh, make me feel and that the uh, that the data that's coming out of um, out of out of the uh, scientists is correct, uh, but the broader point is even if there's even just a small chance of human extinction, and there's this study that came out of Australia that everyone's talking about about how uh, they're predicting the collapse of human civilization, or perhaps more accurately, the very likely collapse of human civilization by the year 2050, which would lead uh, pretty much effectively to mass extinction. Perhaps we're not down to zero people, but uh, the population would diminish so radically that effectively it would be a for, uh, extinction as far as we're concerned. Um, and if there's even a 1% chance that we could go extinct because of what we're doing to the planet, what we've done to the planet, that's a that's a big thing. You know, it's uh, if there's a 1% chance that you're going to get a flat tire, you're, you're probably still going to get in your car and go somewhere. But if there's a 1% chance that you're going to die if you go outside today, you're probably not, you're probably going to stay home. Um, so the downside risk is, is different. Um, I, I think that, uh, so, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm deeply, deeply concerned. And my instinct tells me that this, that this prediction is probably correct, or if anything, optimistic, because every worst case scenario that's been predicted by climatologists um, has turned out to be uh, too optimistic over and over and over again. And I think that we're, you know, the science of it feels like it's a, it's a spiraling collapse where, for example, there's these giant methane balls that are trapped at the bottom of the ocean. And as the water heats up, the methane uh, can be released and that create that methane is itself a greenhouse gas so you end up um, green so climate change causes more climate change um, so it's not linear i think people don't understand that these that the way that this plays out tends to be very um it, it, it tends to happen in a in a you know in a in a in a very um exponential kind of way where as opposed to just getting a little hotter getting a little hotter getting a little hotter it's more just like it's it's like falling out of a building. You're going faster and faster and faster, and then eventually you smack into the sidewalk. Yep, uh, that 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 is a uh, that's that's certainly one way to to look at it. Uh, but okay, let's go down first. first now, obviously, uh, one thing people are going to want to know is: Do you have children yourself? 
Yeah, I do. I have a 15 year old son. Oh, so when you were writing this, I mean that that you know that there is a difference between uh, a, a person with no children and someone who has a 15 year old to write uh, about this intolerably high chance that today's young people will die of one of these. Uh, I mean, so so how does that make you feel as a father? Well, I mean, it makes me sad. Um, you, you know, I mean, it's I don't feel guilty for having brought him into the world. Um, but I think that because uh, I think reproduction is kind of the thing that animals do <laughs> and we're animals. Um, but I do think that, um, it, you know, I mean, it's it isn't it is intolerably sad. It's, it's horrifying to think that he may not get to live out his full natural life, that there's a strong chance that he won't be able to. Um, it's it's horrible. It's just horrifying. And, you know, I mean, the thing is, I think what really is so horrifying about it is that it's so it's so unnecessary. Yeah. It just didn't this did not have to be this way. We needed to we really needed to to do something about this. Um, and we could have and we chose as a as a as a race, not to do anything about it. We we're still not doing anything about it at all. Nothing. Yeah, we're and, still uh, choosing. It's not like we yeah we we chose and, and we're still choosing. And uh, it, it, it it is flat out unbelievable how uh, we're we're in. And it's not just climate change. It's, it's everything denial. Uh, is the way I'm looking at it. Do you pretty much agree that it's that it's gotten to the, just like everything denial? Well, I mean, it's certainly um, yeah. I mean, this we're, we're, we have cre we have managed to create a political system that literally doesn't respond to any problem. I mean, whether it's homelessness or healthcare or anything. I mean, just think about like what you learn about as a kid. You learn about government and politics, right? And how is it supposed to work? It's like the idea is that at any given time, um, human beings, our society, our government has a bunch of problems that need to be fixed. So um, legislators, and I'm not saying specifically in our system, in any governmental system, yeah. um, people debate the issues. They talk about possible solutions. Uh, those things play out in the media, but they also play out one on one just uh, over the over the family dinner table or at work. Um, uh, you know, on the bus or whatnot. And then if, over time, there's a societal consensus that um, builds and elected or non-elected representatives uh, take notice of those problems. And then, um, they, and then the government debates possible solutions and then they work on those solutions. And, and we don't have any of that <laughs> at all. I mean, we literally can't, eat, we're, we're, we're so dysfunctional that we can't even agree that there is a problem, even when all the experts agree that there's a problem. I mean, all the economists agree that income inequality is a massive issue. And even if you're, uh, 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 you love capitalism, that this is going to cause uh, weaknesses in capitalism. Everyone agrees that the healthcare system is, is crazy dysfunctional. People are dying because of it. It's way too expensive. Um, it makes no sense compared to systems that are in other countries that are better. And, and yes, there's no, we don't, we can't even identify that there is a problem. And of course, obviously with the environment, with the environment, the ecocidal um, uh, collapse that's happening now that we can't even agree that it's happening. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, we can't, we can't address a problem if we can't even admit that it, you know, the first step in the 12 step program is to admit you have a problem. We haven't admitted we have a problem. So how can we do anything about it? Yeah. And, and as you've written and more and more people are uh, that, that I interview have, have pointed out that this issue, which which I call the single biggest story ever facing humanity in the history of humanity, uh, is it, it just so far outweighs every one of these other things, very important issues, I mean, health care and all the rest of them, uh, that we're trying to address, uh, that it, it, all of that is going uh, out the window if we don't pay attention to the single 
overriding issue, which is the, the you know, not just the collapse of civilization, but the collapse of this planet. Uh, wh- where do you come in on, on, on that line of thinking? Well, I, I agree with you. I mean, look, I care about a whole lot of issues. I care about police brutality. I care about um, the space program. I care about a lot of things. But the thing is that uh, fundamentally, nothing matters if the planet is gone and we're gone. It, these All politics comes to an end uh, if we come to an end. So, uh, you know, democracy doesn't matter. Nothing matters if we don't save, you know, something as basic as we don't save ourselves. And we, we have to do this. It may be, I think it probably is too late. Um, we should have started this a long, long time ago. But the point is, it's you know nothing's nothing's happening. It is not improving. So uh, you know, you've written. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at this uh, essay. We're all in denial about climate change, and where you address this issue, and so many more people are. Uh, I, I think it was that IPCC report from now, what was it, like 15 months ago, saying we have 12 years to uh, to turn this around, and just what we need to do. So how would you uh, describe what this planet needs to do to turn this around in the, in the opening week of the 2020s? What do we need to do? And what is the chance that we are going to do what we need to do to turn this freight train around? Well, I'm going to start with the uh, second question first, as I often do. Um, The chances are none. (laughs) We're not going to do it. Uh, But what we would need to do is uh, put an end to consumer capitalism, right? And I'm being careful here. I I lean far left. I'm a socialist. I, I would like to see the abolition of capitalism. But I don't think we necessarily need to end capitalism in order to solve the environmental crisis. But what we do have to end is consumer capitalism. Uh, We're two thirds of the uh, US and most of the Western economies are based on production. Uh, We have to have uh, a completely different mindset. I mean, if you look at the Soviet Union, for example, they didn't care about making money selling cars. What What the Soviet government wanted to do was put a car into every citizen's driveway uh, and keep it there as long as possible. So they designed a car. They designed cars that uh, had parts that were easily replaced and could be fixed by pretty much anyone, even if there was no auto repair shop anywhere nearby. Um, they wanted people to keep their cars ideally forever. Um, whereas in the U.S., the economy kind of relies on people uh, getting a new car every couple of years. And uh, those old ones end up in landfills Uh, more sooner rather than later. That's consumer capitalism. Uh, Non-consumer capitalism is about just taking out the very bare necessities of life out of the soil. You know, you don't take out more food than you need. You don't take out more minerals than you need. You don't manufacture anything more than you you, you, you need. It's about a completely different mindset, a different way of looking at the world. It's, It's a world where... You, you couldn't have a problem of hoarding because you would just never have anything extra. Um, you don't need anything extra by definition. So if we are able to, if the major, let's say, 10 or 20 top greenhouse producing nations in the world were to retool themselves to abolish consumer capitalism and make the environment the number one issue or concern, we would have a shot at this, perhaps, um, if it's not already too late, which it may well be too late, because there's so much energy already in the atmosphere uh, over the last two, 200 plus years of uh, since the industrial or beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But, it's, but, it, but assuming that we could do it, that would be the way to do it. You'd have to say, uh, we're, we're just going to completely get rid of the system. The, problem, the reason it's not going to happen is because you would need, the only way this is going to happen is the violent overthrow of all of these governments pretty much simultaneously by mass activism um, in the streets. Um, And that's just, you know, we don't have that. We don't have any kind of 
mass movements really anywhere in the world except for certain trouble spots at any given time, like currently we see in Hong Kong, for example. Um, but we don't have uh, that kind of mass mobilization. So, and not to mention, we don't have, there's not a sense of internationalism where people are able to work in conjunction with their peers in foreign countries, which, you know, is kind of surprising when you think about it, because you would think that the internet could have solved that problem, but it hasn't. And there's no left organization that can lead, there's no modern communist party or socialist party that can lead the people forward and organize them and create a new form of government after the old government is removed. Because the existing governments are all completely useless. They're completely bought and owned by the corporations that are causing the problems. Um, so they, have to, they all have to go, and the corporations all have to go too. Um, and or their more precisely, their their ownership has to be has to be changed, and many of them have to be ramped down. Others have to be closed. Um, so it's just what needs to be done is actually just very simple, but it's just not going to happen. Yes, as you say, I, I like this. Uh, we are going to sleepwalk to our doom in a haze of social media and corporate entertainment distraction and and that's that that's the bottom line uh yeah i just don't see it changing I, I just there's no there's no evidence you know that it's going to change anytime uh, one wishes extinct but, extinction rebellion and the green new deal that some people that i've interviewed have have offered those two up as evidence that we're going to turn this freight train around where do you where do you line up on Extinction Rebellion and the Green New Deal uh, turning well, the freight train around? Well, there, I, I don't see any Extinction Rebellion. So, I mean, you know, like a, <laughs> having a turning something into a phrase, um, you know, it's a, look, uh, I don't know. It's like, where is it? It's like uh, there's there's literally in this country right now, as we speak, there is not one single uh, environmental protest going on that accounts for more than say 10 sad looking people in the rain. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, there's nothing going on. So it's just bullshit. And then there in terms of uh, the green new deal, uh, look, I have, I have, I'm very impressed by, for example, Bernie Sanders. And, you know, he has, he put forward a, a very ambitious plan, pol ambitious politically, perhaps not ambitious enough to save our, ourselves, but, Still, an imp by the standards of American electoral politics, a very impressive plan to um, to abolish all uh, all carbon emissions uh, by 2030, which is uh, great. Um, but you know, the fact is, it's a pipe dream, right? I mean, because even if you assume like a really good outcome, like let's say uh, Democrats seize control of the Senate and Democrats uh, pick up seats in the House. And you get some and some of the conservative Democrats get primaried out by more uh, progressive Democrats in the uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez mold. Right. So I'm painting a picture that's very unlikely to happen, by the way. Um, but let's just say that that were to happen. Like, just let's just say, right. right. Let's just stipulate something that just not going to ha occur. But if it did, um, OK, well, you're still the, the green the Green New Deal is still not going to pass because there's still too many um, too many of the Democrats are conservative and too and pretty much all of them are beholden to these corporate interests. And even if Bernie Sanders himself is the president and just does not care, he can't do this without Congress. Uh, so there's just never going to be in this system the ability to to change what, to, to give us what we need. And, you know, we're not in a position now where we can compromise. You can't, you know, you don't throw someone half a life preserver, <laughs> you preserver, you know, it's like when you need, uh, you know, when you need two antibiotic pills a day, one's not going to get you better. It's actually going to make you worse yeah. off in the, in the long run. Um, so you need, you know, you need the whole thing. Um, you, you know, we, but American politics is completely set up for the, well, it's the incremental approach, like we did with healthcare. Like, well, it's lame, but you know we can work on it and get there later. 
Like, no, because the whole thing is going down. So we need it all yesterday. And anything less than that is garbage. And so we might as well just prepare for our doom. Okay, well, speaking of that, let's, uh, let, let, let's talk about that. So getting back to this, uh, your opening salvo for 2020. So it is time for people who are younger than I am to start thinking about how they want to spend the rest of their likely to be truncated lives and how they plan to face mass premature death. And then you talk about a couple of options, but you end up here. Nihilism is about to become the best, worst possible life strategy. Life is meaningless. That will soon become obvious. So, Ted Rawl, uh, define how you understand nihilism and explain what you mean about uh, it about to become the best, worst possible life strategy. What is it and what do you mean by best, worst possible life strategy? Well, um, again, going, going second first, um, it's, it, it's the best, worst possible in that all the choices are bad, but among all the bad choices, <laughs> this is the one that makes the most sense. Um, you know, I mean, one would prefer to have cause for optimism, but since there isn't really, uh, you might as well just accept reality. Uh, nihilism is the belief that in the absence of, uh, of, of inherent moral uh, strictures and guidelines, that nothing really means anything. Um, and I think, you know, with, with, as we face, we stare down the, the barrel of human extinction, um, it's uh, you do you have to arrive at the at the conclusion that that um, religion and philosophy never no longer provide the answers that human beings are looking for in life. Um, that fundamentally we're going to come to an end, and it's not going to matter any more in the greater scheme of things than the fact that uh, you know some some type of of turtle went extinct. It's not going to matter. I mean, it <laughs> mattered to the turtles. Uh, a lot, but it's not going to matter. It doesn't matter to any. Life goes on. It just goes on without us. Uh, I think I suspect the planet will go on. It will just go on without us. Um, it'll be different forms of life. But if you're so, if you think about that, like you know, what gets people up in the morning? Like, why are we doing this podcast? Right? We we're doing this podcast because we hope and think that other people will listen to it and get something out of it, hopefully something that makes them think, maybe even better, something that makes them act. But when you realize at a certain point that nothing's going to change no matter what we do, then why would we bother to do this podcast? We wouldn't. You might as well just have a day. <laughs> Enjoy your day. Uh, just, you know, don't, don't be planning ahead. Don't be plotting or scheming. Uh, you know, don't don't try to write the great American novel. Just enjoy yourself because as much as you can, because that's all there is. That's nihilism. Uh, it's well, not necessarily how, uh, a negative thing. Yeah, well, that is uh, when when people ask me, I was just having this discussion with actually having a discussion with a real life friend, which is amazing enough to actually get in this discussion with pe you know people outside of the what I call the what I do here down in the doomosphere, but just in my regular life. That's you know she was asking, well, Sam, if if you think that there's no hope. Why, you know, basically, why do you, you know, what are you hoping to accomplish? And I'm saying I, I, I'm saying I'm just advising people to get out there and enjoy this while you still can. I call it Girl Scout cookie time. Uh, get out there and enjoy Girl Scout cookie time while you still can because the Girl Scout cookies are getting ready to go bye-bye. You know, and, and that's really the bottom line advice is, is you better grab anything you can while you still can. And it sounds like that, 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 you, that, that you agree with that, uh, with that bottom line. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish there was more to it than that, but there isn't. I mean, it's, it's a bummer. 
but it is what it is, you know, I mean, as, as, as the expression goes. It is what it is. And it's soon not going to be anything. So you know, might as well just, you know, uh, relax and enjoy yourself because that's, that's kind of all there is. And, and obviously, I mean, I mean you're a, a cartoonist, so, I mean, clearly you are still resort to uh, what, what I would call black ironic humor. I mean, here's the, just, to, just to give you guys an idea, here, here are two of his cartoons. One is called Sorry, But It Really Is Too Late to Save the World and the last sentence of which is the bummer about Trump is that his voice might be the last thing we will ever hear. And then here's one, Welcome to Decision 2060, when, uh, you know, he has four panels in the cartoon, and the fourth panel is blank, because there will be no uh, presidential election in the year 2020, because, as you say, uh, humanity went extinct 10 years ago. So talk, talk about how to, how to have a sense of humor in using dark humor as one of your weapons to survive the, uh, the oncoming uh, collapse? Well, I think, you know, people, the people have uh, told jokes in death camps. They've told jokes before uh, they were executed. I mean, it's, uh, if you don't have your sense of humor, what do you got? Um, you know, it's like, I think it's an important, maybe not survival skill, but it's psychologically it certainly makes worth life life worth living. And one of the things I hate is BS. And humor has a way of cutting through the BS and getting you to you know to, to reality. Um, and if we're all going to die, let's not like all die like go out and like pretend like it ain't happening. Like let's let's like really own this experience psychologically. And uh, and accept that it's going to happen and, and do it communally because it's going to be the last thing we do and we should probably do it right. So I think um, having a sense of humor is, is, is absolutely, it's not a something that people should do because, you know, it's just because, I mean, I think it's actually like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the essence of being human. Um, you know, I remember I didn't really care for uh, president Reagan, but I remember being very, uh, you know, thinking it was kind of great that when he was shot, he was cracking jokes with the uh, staff at the at the hospital where he was taken uh, after the shooting by uh, John Hinckley. And, um, you know, I thought, I thought that was quintessentially human. And I thought it spoke well of him that he was able to yeah. do that. Um, and, um, I, I, you know, so I, I just don't, I just can't believe there would be people who would not understand that. Of course, obviously, there are. Um, but <laughs> it's uh, it's too bad for them, and uh, I think they should take my advice. Yeah, Ronald Ronald Reagan really was funny, and, and so was Baby Bush. I, I mean, I have to admit, I, I would actually uh, like to sit down and have a beer with uh, with Baby Bush. I, I I think it would be an entertaining hour. Uh, <laughs> now, Donald Trump. I, I don't know if Donald Trump has a sense of humor. Does that man have a sense of humor or not? I don't know. You know, I wrote an entire book about it, <laughs> and um, I never, in my research, uh, came in. Uh, you know, got got the sense that he has a sense of humor in the way that most of us would define it. Um, but you know, I, I think I think he has kind of like a a grim, uh, self interested um, sense of humor. That's but it's not like what most people would consider funny really it's more like uh he he i mean look he can be a funny guy i mean like for example well, when well even sometimes <laughs> i think it isn't i mean look democrats don't give him any credit and i understand why but like for example when at at the uh at that rally where he said like hey russia if you've got the hillary's emails uh please let us know you know um uh that was like obviously a joke um, and, uh, he, you know, it's not like you, you know, it, at the impeachment hearings, people said, oh, you know, he actually asked a foreign country to interfere in our election. Like, well, that's not an example of that. Right. He didn't really. Um, it's just it ain't true. 
And so I think he's, um, you know, he has that kind of humor, but it's not like a, it's kind of like a, it's a mean humor. It's not really a kind humor, but. It's kind of like pulling, uh, pulling wings off of flies in, in, in the window. Anyway, we, we might get back to Donald Trump a, a little, a little bit later, but uh, <clears throat> just to continue, continue in this phase, so are, are you finding it harder to uh, approach this situation uh, as a cartoonist? Is it getting harder or is it getting easier to come up with uh, cartoon ideas as this whole thing comes unraveled? Well, no, it's, it, I've never had a, look, if you have problems coming up with ideas, it, you know, this is not a good gig for you. Um, so, but, so I've never had that problem. I mean, I think the problem with any kind of extreme scenario is that it's hard to draw a good cartoon about it. And the reason is because, you know, cart good cartoons are about exaggeration. You look at something and you say like, what if blah, blah, you know, so this like silly thing, strange thing happened. And what if it was even crazier than what? Well, the, you know, you don't have that uh, when something is already as crazy as it gets. Yeah. Hard to beat human extinction for craziness. I mean, that, that's about as crazy as it gets. Um, so, you know, you, you can make jokes about, about it. You can make jokes about the lack of uh, awareness um, that people have or the denial. That's for sure. That's kind of funny. Um, but that only goes so far. And when you get into like the details, like, Hey, we're all going to die again, you kind of run out of material. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. I heard who is that, uh, woman, one, one to somebody being interviewed on, uh, on NPR by Terry Gross recently. And, and Terry was asking uh, Wanda Sykes, I believe, uh, you, you know, a, a kind of along the same, obviously NPR was not talking about human extinction, uh, but just on a lesser level, just as things are, are so crazy with from Donald Trump on around this planet, whether it's hard, as Wanda was saying, it, it, it's harder for me to come up with jokes because there's nothing I can come up with that 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 will beat the the you know the morning headlines in the mainstream media. It's the best comedy routine in the history of humanity. Are are you running up against the problem that Wanda is? Well, I certainly do. For example, I have one client that shall remain nameless that, that often wants me to do cartoons about Trump's tweets, and I'm like. These tweets are cartoons. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you yeah. know, I mean, like, there's how do I add that to it? I mean, he's literally the for people who are familiar with professional wrestling, he's literally the character of the heel, the archetype of the heel. He's literally a troll. He's a live troll president. I mean, you it, you just can't go beyond that. It's it's insane. So. Yeah, I don't know how the writers for the Onion. Uh, I don't. I don't know how the Onion uh, is even surviving at, at, at this point. I did a video one time. What I did was I, I read ten uh, direct headlines from you know the newspaper, the Onion, and I mm. read ten headlines from Yahoo News, and I said I challenge anybody to uh, go through these 20 headlines and put the, you know, the 10 headlines and which 10 of these came from the onion and which 10 came from the mainstream media. Uh, so do you, do you mine the mainstream? Like, like what I do every day is, I mean, the first three hours of my day for what I do in my life is I simply mine the mainstream media and then just you know pick out something and read and help people read between the lines how do you start your day is that is, is that i'm the you? same way i mean look i used to you know I, I have tried a lot of different approaches to doing uh political satire and commentary both in in my columns and and in my cartoons and one way that is a sure fail in the u.s is to read like very like highbrow, interesting, intellectual, left-leaning stuff, and then draw cartoons that echo it yeah. and expect that anyone will know what the hell you're talking <laughs> about and think that you're like, that you're like not wackadoodle. They, you have to, the thing is, they'll just say like, oh, even if you print something that is, you, you, you're satirizing something that's 
undeniably true. Um, it's like you just they, people will just skip over it because they're so completely propagandized by the media yeah. um, that they won't even recognize it as being something that they should pay attention to. So what you want to do is start with like the you know some cultural, some political or social propaganda meme that's all over the place, and then dissect it or make fun of it. Like for example, uh, with the um, assassination of uh, Qassam Soleimani, in, uh, the general in, in, uh, in Iraq, the Iranian general, um, they, you know, they, they keep saying, well, this is a bad guy. He killed hundreds of Americans. And they just leave it at that. Even Elizabeth Warren said that. And it's like a meme. They all say it, yeah. right? It's just, they all, he killed hundreds of Americans. So, you know, you want, it's, it, it's like, I've been saying this, and it's important to repeat this. Uh, look, these hundreds of Americans were U.S. troops occupying Iraq. Uh, these weren't like, uh, you know, people at the mall in Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> you know, these are, it's, it makes it sound like they were, or like, you yeah, know, yeah. and it's like, uh, you know, or it makes them sound like they were American tourists in Paris or something. Like, no, these are like troops. You know, they're a million, it's a fair, completely fair military target to kill soldiers in a war zone, in a war that they're not even supposed to be in because it's illegal. So, uh, yeah, I'm not saying it's not sad for their families, but, you know, it was sad for the for the soldiers in the SS, too, uh, when they got killed, and it was sad for their families, too. So, um, you know, it's and it's comparable role that they're playing. So, um, you know, so but that's left out. Uh, there's so much if you uh, watch. I was uh, recently watching uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo on TV, and he was just it's notably saying things that were all true, except they were truthy, as uh, the expression goes, because it's it's about what they leave out. Yeah, the, yeah, it's, yeah, the, yeah. it's devoid of context. <laughs> yeah, right. Like they like during the build up to the Iraq War, they would say, "Well, you know, Saddam Hussein supports terrorism." And Americans, two years after 9-11, are thinking about al-Qaeda and 9-11. They're not thinking about Hezbollah in, in Israel, but uh, Saddam's support was Hezbollah in Israel. It was not al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was his mortal enemy, and he had nothing to do with 9-11 at all. And, uh, al, you know, it's like Iran, Iraq had absolutely no involvement there. So it's about what they leave out, always. Uh, definitely. So as long as we, since, since this is the number, the number one news story now, I, I agree with you. I notice on your uh, on your mission statement how you point out when something is being so just soaked uh, in the media when everybody, every commentator, every cartoonist, every columnist is is talking about the same issue that if you don't, that if you can't think of anything fresh to bring to the discussion, you, you tend just to sit it out. Are, are you sitting out this one or are you coming, or have you come up with columns or, or cartoons about it? How are you, how are you playing this latest blunder? Well, so I definitely am going to probably do at least one cartoon about the uh, Soleimani thing, just probably based on the lines that I just told you about the whole, hey, when you're a U.S. Uh, soldier, uh, you know, serving in an illegal war, you should probably expect that the locals are going to try to kill you because that's kind of how that goes. Um, and, uh, and you know, I just I just literally just finished my column for, for this week, uh, which takes an interesting, or actually I hope it's interesting, but takes a different angle um, from uh, most other people, which is to say, I realize, you know, I've been to Iran, and uh, most people haven't. In fact, most reporters haven't. So I just wrote a piece that was about my trip to Iran and what it was like and what I saw, because I thought it would put a little bit of meat on the bones yeah. for people who are trying to get a sense of that country. Um, and uh, so it's not really like a ranting editor an editorial rant it's uh, more just like hey you guys don't know much about iran you might want to you know i know a little bit about it here's what i know so uh yeah i still i, I adhere to that mission statement look the world doesn't need it's kind of like when someone dies tragically like let's say you know there's a school shooting the world doesn't need another cartoon that says it's sad when people yeah, are killed yeah. by mass shooters it is i will go on record and say it is sad 
when people are killed by mass shooters. It is always sad. Um, but the thing is that uh, there are so many of those cartoons, so much coverage, so many essays that all say that same exact thing that no one cares whether Ted Rawl says it too. Um, yeah, and if yeah. they do care, they're, 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 they need psychological counseling. Um, so it's uh, so I just don't do it. It's redundant. I mean, it's, I feel like it's a waste of my muse. Yeah, that, like that's, I could that's... be focused on other stuff. I could serve my readers better doing other yeah, things. That that that's pretty much the way I'm playing it. The only the only comment I've made on this thing is. And then I, I can't believe that Elizabeth Warren shows up in the mainstream media this morning saying the exact same thing that I was saying the day after it happened, uh, that, that my reading of it is that certainly one of the, if not the major, one of the major reasons that he did that was to get uh, the, all of this news about the impeachment off the mainstream media, and he has completely succeeded. The only the only article in the top 100 stories on the mainstream media today that mentions the word impeachment was Elizabeth Warren agreeing with me that he did this to get the to get impeachment off the mainstream media. That's the only time you see the word impeachment. Uh, yeah. do, do you think, I mean, where do you, do you agree with Elizabeth and, and, and me that that's one of the major reasons that he pulled this latest stunt? Well, from his point of view, it, from his point of view, it certainly doesn't hurt. Now, does it? Um, you know, I think it's, uh, there's obviously a wag the dog component to this. Is it the only thing? No, I don't. I think, I, I don't think so. I think this is more the behavior of a mafia Don who is just <laughs> trying to whack a rival, uh, a member of the other family, to get their attention. And uh, I think he actually does want a deal. And in his sick, twisted mind, he actually thinks this is going to get him closer to one. In that way, he's not even unique. He's very, it's very American. I mean, the um, before the Paris peace talks, Henry Kissinger advised Richard Nixon to uh, step up the bombings of Cambodia yeah. and Vietnam in order to, quote unquote, soften up the Vietnamese yeah. at the at the at the peace uh, table. It doesn't really at the negotiating table. I mean, I don't think human psychology really works that way. Um, I think if anything, it tends to people tend to dig in their heels when they're under siege and when they're being attacked. And what they're really looking for is uh, gestures of goodwill, not uh, you know the hard ass approach. But when you're, you know, to be America, America, you know, just absolutely exemplifies the, the cliche that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, that's our foreign policy. And I think that's more what's going on than anything else. But I'm sure in Tr Trump's mind, he, he also knows going into an election year, facing an impeachment trial, although it's not like he's going to be removed in the Senate anyway, uh, but facing an impeachment trial he is uh, thinking, well, you know, this will certainly uh, war is good for unifying the country behind the president. Uh, you know, George W. Bush was reelected handily over yeah. both a pacifist and a war hero in the form of John Kerry. And it was already he'd already been discovered to have lied about WMDs in Iraq by the time he won that reelection. But it didn't matter because Americans tend to rally behind their, their sitting incumbent president. I mean, Trump knows that. So it's, I mean, say what you want about Trump. He has very, very strong uh, political instincts. And, uh, you know, he's, that's what he has more than anything is the, in, the, the, the animal cunning. Um, and, uh, you know, people, people don't give him credit for that. But he had far more instincts than uh, Hillary Clinton ever did. Okay, well, I, I just I, I I could spend well, we only got a few minutes left. I I could easily go on and on about Trump bashing, but we're gonna. I, I just want to. Uh, I I should have touched on this at the very beginning of the interview. I do I do want to just getting back getting back to your own story, Ted. Uh, now now you've been around for uh, a, a long time, and I I mean I I think I've been seeing your cartoons. Good Lord. 20, uh, 20, 25 years, but when did you actually 
when when did you get down this rabbit hole? Uh, that this whole uh, what I call the Doomer rabbit hole. I mean, obviously your earlier work you weren't talking about uh, near term human extinction and the collapse of global industrial society. When did you start? When did you start coming down here, and what was it that brought you here? And do you see you ever climbing back out? Well, um, you know, I've, look, I've been, I like everyone, um, you know, who's listening to this, I read a lot. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I read a lot was Derek, uh, Derek Jensen's work. Um, but I'm also, uh, you know, look, I, I have, I come from a scientific background. I was, uh, I spent three years at Columbia Engineering School and I'm good at pattern recognition. You know, I, I'm the kind of person who can, you know, if, if you tell me like, hey, so, uh, Ted, let's go grab a beer at this bar and I'll ask you like five questions. And, you know, like, how loud is it? How are the booths? <laughs> you know, yeah. is it dark? Is it light? I can tell you with pretty good degree of accuracy, or at least I can tell myself whether I'm likely to have a good time or a bad time. I just know. And, um, so, like, as I've been reading all the reports and watching the increasing pessimism of the uh, of the scientific community about the prospects for human survival and being able to avoid that four degrees Celsius over uh, the over the baseline at the beginning of before the industrialization, um, you know, it's just it just be, it's been clear to me, increasingly clear for years, and it hasn't been a focus of my work because frankly I'm not an expert on this on this field but now there's so many um, scientists who are on record as being very pessimistic and I'm just not going to ignore them I mean they're yeah. obviously know what they're saying they're obviously right um, everything they say makes perfect sense the science isn't particularly complicated or difficult to understand um, you know, green, the greenhouse effect is not a difficult thing to understand at all. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's so, yeah, it's been something that's been percolating. And frankly, I've been waiting for people who are uh, more notable, more famous, uh, richer, more powerful than me to step forward and start shouting. And apparently that it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> now we have to rely on a 12 year old girl to do it. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, I, I guess now it's like, it's everybody's responsibility to speak up. Well, so what kind of reaction, uh, what, what kind of blowback have you gotten from your opening salvo for 2020 and have you lost any friends and do you think it was a good career move? Well, I don't give a shit if it's a good career move or not, but I think it's a uh, it's very clearly um, it's it's caused it's generated a lot of discussion. Um, a lot of people were very happy to see it because they're kind of hoping they're kind of waiting. Like, why is, why aren't more people speaking out? And so I was giving voice to the voiceless in that sense. So then all at the same time, especially people who have who are parents who have children are very, um, you know, kind of like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're saying that. Are you really saying, like, I cried when I read your story? I've had close friends who literally couldn't read all the way through, refused yeah. to read all the way through yeah. um, because they were so upset about it, you know. And, uh, well, you know, denial's a bitch. What can I say? I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's like people have to wake up. Um, it's it's like, you know, I, I I'm not the one destroying the, the the environment simply because I'm pointing it out, you know, yeah. and I can't make it stop because I'm not a wizard. So it's like, um, you know, all I'm doing is is uh, reminding people of the obvious that's been already widely reported by very reputable news organizations. Yep, and that's what that's what I'm doing, but brother, I assure you, you're you're, you're talking to a former uh, real estate agent and house flipper uh, who used to live in a beautiful home and make a hundred thousand dollars a year. And let me tell you, that went down the toilet ten years ago when I uh, when I made this career choice. But anyway. Uh, Ted Rawl, this has been a lot of fun. I cannot believe that uh, global industrial civilization is getting ready to collapse on this camera in six minutes. So as I do with every one of my guests, uh, to wrap up, 
Ted Rawl, if you were not speaking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles, but actually had the mainstream media with a microphone in your face saying, Ted, you have 60 seconds to give your message to humanity in the opening week of 2020, what would your 60 second soundbite to the world sound like? I would say you're out of time. Procrastination time is finished. You're, it's probably too late to save yourself. There is no bigger priority. There's no equal priority. There's not even a close second priority to environmental concerns. Uh, everything, the, whenever every, anybody talks about how we have to compromise between jobs and the environment, that's not true. Um, the environment always has to come first because there's not going to be any jobs if there's no people. And there won't be any people if there's no environment. So you have to, we need to, we need to, together, I need to, you need to, we all need to wake up. We need to get rid of our existing governments. We have to take over our countries and completely retool our economies in ways that replace industrial capitalism with a sustainable economy that extracts the very bare minimum of resources out of the earth and then also works retroactively to try to clean up the mess that we've made in the form of, for example, the giant plastic islands in the middle of the oceans. Uh, there is nothing more important. There can be nothing more important. And if you don't do this, you're stupid. There you go. And, and, and meanwhile, while you're doing that, get out there and enjoy it while you, while you still can, uh, while that's happening. But Ted Raw, uh, it has been a lot of fun. Stick around for a minute after, uh, after we finish up so we, can, um, so we can talk for just a minute. But for right now, guys, I hate to say this, uh, but we have got to say, uh, we have got to wrap this up. And if you enjoyed what Ted had to say to us, would you please spend a few seconds to go over there and thumb it up? If you did not enjoy what Ted Rawl had to say to you in the past hour, please take a few seconds to thumb it down. And by all means, uh, uh, subscribe. That's the word I'm looking for to uh, Collapse Chronicles for more of these interviews. But with that... I have got to say, Ted Rawl, we really appreciate you taking an hour out of your busy schedule to come preach to the choir over here at Collapse Chronicles, and more importantly, keep up the good work. You can say bye if you want to. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> bye, guys.